we are so held up in life by fear, by worry, by obligations, by past failures. You got one life at this thing. Like, who, who cares what people are going to think about you? Who cares if you've made a mistake? Here we go. What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy, Matt Zapali here, hailing to you from the Money Smart Movement headquarters here in Oak Brook, Illinois, home of the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel. I'm your Money Smart Guy, Matt Zapali here. And my guest today is my good friend, business partner, board counsel of PHP Agency, featured on Forbes and Yahoo Finance, Mr. George Palayo. How you doing, George? Brother, excited for today, excited for the episode. So I'm excited for you, man. If if ever thought about winning as a young entrepreneur, you're in your late teens, you're in your early 20s, uh, you're, you're in for the Facebook Live, you're in for the show, you're watching the right video. Because especially in a time today, what, where there's close to 50 million people filing for unemployment, we're in the midst of a pandemic. People that worked in the industry that George and I worked in, I was an Olive Garden server. George was a Red Lobster server. We were, we're, were former Darden employees, Darden restaurant employees. Uh, the sad part, we're, we're laughing about it, but it's no laughing matter, especially now, because even if you had a hard time getting a job, you couldn't fall back on the job we fell back on, which is being a server at a restaurant because you can't even get a job right now uh, uh, very easily as a server. So um, so if you're out there right now, you're, you're looking for your next move, you're looking for your next hustle, you think, hmm, entrepreneurship, is it for me? Sales, business ownership, uh, something that we've never done before in my entire life, our family's life, you're in, you're watching the right Facebook live video. So George, uh, uh, you started you started entrepreneurship at 18 years old. Take us back. Take us back to what you were thinking at 18 years old, your, your, your late teens, uh, when you stumbled across business. I was looking for the fastest way to get to my dream life, period. And uh, I wanted to, uh, I had a couple things I wanted to do. I wanted to travel the world, wanted to take care of mom, uh, mom and dad, wanted to buy him a home, wanted to buy a nice car, wanted to have some money in the bank. Uh, I never, well, the, the thing that I, that, that I think I liked about entrepreneurship the most that uh, motivated me to become an entrepreneur was the control of time. Uh, the fact that you are deciding what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it, getting away from having to do something, getting away from a, a schedule um, and a boss, getting away from a boss, getting away from somebody that tells you what to do. That, that for me, there was nothing... And, and I think that, I think we all want that. I don't know anybody, even if they're an employee today and they're, they're doing that, nothing wrong with being an employee if you are, but there's more potential that that, that person has. And, uh, okay, perfect. I was like, what's happening? Uh, there's more. Mr. I'm featured in Forbes. There's, uh, there's more potential that that person has. And um, I, I think even every employee in the world would rather be their own boss. And they actually did something, Matt. It was in uh, Daniel Pink's book. I think it was called Drive. And they did it with Best Buy. They took away all the schedules from headquarters, not the stores, but headquarters. And they said, what's going to happen? Will we do worse or will we do better? And everybody was more productive with being able to control their own schedules. They got the job done. They enjoyed their life more. So I think for me, it was control of time and control of money. I think everybody wants those two things and very few people have them. I think sometimes people say, you know what, uh, I want that. I want to accomplish that. I want that in my life. But next thing you know, boom, they start business. They start sales because, you know, entrepreneurship is just sales. You're just selling your idea. Um, they face their first round of rejection. Their friends and family may either believe them or not believe them. What was, what was the first roadblocks you went into when you wanted to share your dream? I think I, I overestimated everybody's receptiveness of it. I thought everybody was going to be excited for me and uh, everybody was going to be interested in joining my team and becoming a client. And uh, I quit my job before even having a license. In our business, you need to get a license. It takes a week or two to get. But I quit my job. I didn't have a license. I was like, it's all good. I'll make six figures. I really overestimated um, my ability and I underestimated the work that was necessary and um, I realized what a small percentage of people becoming an entrepreneur, I realized, and, and we're, we're in the business of helping people with money and teaching people about money. I realized how few people actually make good financial decisions and how few people actually want to do the work that's necessary to go become wealthy. And so um, I think that, that, that was a little bit of discouraging. 
Uh, I definitely didn't have the market of people that I needed. Uh, so I had to go prospect. That was the hardest thing. That stuff scared that, you know, walking up to somebody or talking to somebody or picking up a phone or, and I, 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 I overdid it in my mind of, Hey, you're just, you know, you have something good. You're calling somebody to see if they need help in that area. So learning, learning to look at prospecting is something natural. Like, Hey, if you owned a restaurant, right. You'd be like, Hey, come try the food. Or um, if you sold real estate, you tell people, Hey, I'm a realtor uh, or you do taxes or whatever, you know, you'd market yourself. And I wasn't used to marketing me. Um, I was used to working at a place, working for somebody, marketing somebody, but never marketing me. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they go through that, that transition of having to learn to prospect, um, learn to get clients, learn to talk, learn to build belief in yourself. And so it was definitely a process. Um, and it, it took a little bit longer to make the money than I thought it was going to take for sure. I mean, you, if, if anything, you picked one of the hardest careers and businesses to get into as a, as a teenager, as a young 20 year old, because you're dealing with finance, you're dealing with people's money and retirement. And I, I can imagine, I was, tw- at least I was 24 when I started my business, you know, I was kind of like mid twenties, but you were like, what, you were what, 18, 19. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, was, was insurance your first business or, or, or did you try to take a stab in like real estate or other things? Um, I got my real estate license because my neighbor was making like 30 grand a month selling real estate. So I said, Oh, I'm going to go sell real estate. And right after I got my license, I still hadn't sold the house. My friends said, look at insurance. And I was so, I was still flexible. That's something that a lot of people, once they kind of get into an industry, they're like, no, this is all I'm going to do. And I was still flexible. I was brand new to it. So I said, yeah, I'll look at it. And uh, I go to the meeting, meet Patrick. I'm inspired. I come back. I tell my broker uh, and he's like, uh, you know, you're going to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. That's not going to work for you. And I was like, damn, and this guy's making a million. Maybe I should listen to him. So then I go back to Patrick and um, and Patrick said, uh, George, do you want to be the owner of, of uh, Prudential or the top producer? And I said, what do you mean? He said, do you want to own the company or do you want to be one of their top salespeople? I said, no, I want to own the company. And he says, Prudential has a lot of different divisions. You can help people with real estate. You can help people with money. You can help people with insurance. You don't have to do it all, but you could still help people with a lot of things. And then he asked me the most important question. He says, who has the life you want? And I said, well, definitely not my teachers, definitely not my, my, my GM at Red Lobster. And it was between real estate and insurance. And the reason we, uh, we went to insurance over real estate was he says, what, ha- what happens to your broker? Right? He makes a million dollars a year. What happens every month on the first? How much money does he make? I said, zero. And uh, he said, what if he wants to leave for vacation? When's the last time you see him take a two, three week vacation? I said, no, he doesn't take vacations. He can't. He said, so you want to be in something 30 years later that you can never walk away from. So basically you bought a job. And mm-hmm. I said, man, uh, I don't want that. And I looked at people in insurance. These guys were making a quarter million, half a million, million dollars a year passive after building a team, building an office. And I said, I'm going that route. And uh, just grateful that we went that route. You know, today I'm 33. We have a business. Um, don't have to worry, especially in this e- economy right now. Don't have to worry about uh, a lot of things. Thank God. So Patrick that he's referencing to, for those of you that don't know, our business family is the name of Patrick Bet David host of Valley Team and CEO of PHP Agency. And uh, I just want to share with you, if you haven't seen him already, this is uh, the Patrick that he's discussing and talking about. So the, here's you with uh, your, was that your, your uh, Z, was it Z07 uh, Corvette there? And this is when uh, Patrick had the uh, the Ferrari. He's moved down for like three cars out there. So is uh, our fellow business partner there, uh, uh, Jose Gaetan. But this is you talking about you know, how to find a mentor. mentor. Back to a job and just gone back to what was comfortable. Uh, but that mentor is the one that sees your future you and challenges you to become that person um, while sympathizing with your situation. So, so, so Patrick, but David came to you and hey, Bob, if, if, if you haven't watched this video, you got to watch this video, how to find a mentor here in Valuetainment, which George was, George and uh, Jose Gautam was featured on. Um, what, what was some of the first questions? I'm curious, you know, uh, uh, what was the, First questions that uh, outside of the ones you just mentioned earlier and in your growth, what was some of the tough, challenging questions that Patrick Ben David had asked you to cause you to rethink how you thought about money and entrepreneurship as a young entrepreneur? Um, I think I think the first thing that I had to to learn outside of prospecting was was the concept of being in sales. And um, you know, people look down on sales today. I was reading something to my guys last night, and it's in Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And Robert Kiyosaki, I think he's speaking in Shanghai, and he sits down with this girl who's a, she's a news uh, paper writer, uh, news reporter. And uh, she says, man, you're the best-selling author in the world. And 
She says, I write, but none of my stuff takes off. And he says, you're a phenomenal writer. I think you should go and take a sales class. And she says, what? Are you kidding me? I went, I, I became educated. I went and got a degree so that I wouldn't have to learn sales. Like I don't, I, I went and got a degree. And she literally said, I went and got a degree. So I wouldn't have to do that. I hate sales. Hmm. And he says, so you, you want to, he says, he says, look at, look at, look at what my book says. And it's on your notes. It says best selling author. And you want to be best writing author or you want to be best <laughs> selling author. And she left pissed. She walked away. But I think that skill of learning, learning sales um, is it's, it's the highest paid skill in the world, man. In business, it's the highest paid skill. People, people, oh, oh and what, what did it say? It says school teaches you to specialize in something, right? And, and, and you really, to, to kind of dive into one thing, get locked into one thing. Mm -hmm. And Robert Kiyosaki talks about in his book, how he tried so many different things, military, left that, uh, got a job ended up getting a job at Xerox just because it taught him sales yeah. and then left that and then went here and he just wanted experience. And it said, most people want uh, uh, just a job, but successful people want experience and skill sets. Mm -hmm. And so uh, learning those skill sets of communication, um, uh, sales, prospecting, leadership, uh, those were things that, those were the hardest things to learn. Prospecting, then sales and leadership, because it was kind of in that order for me uh, were, were some of the things that I had to learn and it wasn't natural to me. Um, I was super young, so it took a lot of preparation. I had to read a lot, yep. a lot and over prepare where somebody that maybe was older, more credible and had a degree. I did not college dropout server. Um, so I had to work on myself and it's, it doesn't matter where you are today. If you're willing to do the work and over prepare, you'll find confidence in your preparation. And uh, so I, so connecting to the process of, uh, of becoming an entrepreneur, what that schedule looked like and the commitment and the personal development, that was something new to me. So George, people are watching this right now. Young entrepreneur, you just mentioned sales. They don't teach sales in high school. They don't teach sales in college. You're one of the best trainers, not only in PHP agency regarding this topic, but Pat, you know, I, I've been in planning meetings for our conventions, our national conventions where Magic Johnson shows up and Kevin Hart shows up and the late, great Kobe Bryant shows up. And the question arises, who can we hire as a sales speaker, as a sales trainer to come to our company? And I've seen our CEO say, George, what are you talking about? You're the best trainer out there as, as, as it relates to the subject. I, don't, I can't think of anybody else to teach on a topic of sales than you. You, as in George Palayo. So if you're going to give Matt. Yeah, bro. So if, if, if you were going to give guidance to a young entrepreneur right now, watching this Facebook live, watching this YouTube episode. Is there any tips that you would give for somebody in your preparation to be good in sales? Because sometimes people think salesman is bad or car salesman, win, lose situation. Uh, and people just have a negative connotation to the word sales or salesperson. Yeah, I, I broke it down to three P's. Um, people are, so first of all, my number one was learning the product, um, learning the presentation and learning people. And I think that's what sales for me is the product, whatever you're, whatever you're, you're marketing or you're selling. Um, if you become an expert in it and you become a believer in that product, uh, you're going to feel comfortable when you're talking to people about what you're doing. And so mastering the product, taking the time to really learn what you're selling, what's the benefit of it, what's the value, who is it good for, who is it not good for. Um, and so I, I think I, I became very familiar with that because when I started to go into those, those meetings and I went from trying to just sell something to I really believe in what I'm selling and I see the value in it, my whole body language changed and I became comfortable and they say 55% of what we do is, is body language. 38% is tone of voice and 7% is actual content language. And, and so, <laughs> huh? And words, you know? Yeah, the words. And so I think, I think learning the product changed my, uh, my level of confidence when I was sitting down with people because I really believed in what I was doing. And then the second thing was, because I was really nervous and I was new and it's normal to be, to, to be nervous when you're new, um, I had to really write out my entire presentation verbatim and I wrote down everything that I was going to say and everything that that person could say and every question they could ask. And I remember staying up probably like one night till three, four in the morning. And I was just typing, typing, typing. 
because I was so nervous. I would, I would lose my, my train of thought and I had to work on, on kind of developing some consistency in my presentation. And then the last part was learning people. So once I got comfortable with the product and once I got comfortable with the presentation or the way I was explaining what we offer, what we do, because some of you guys are in different industries. Um, then from there, I was able to really understand people. And there's two things that Nick Murray talks about in his book, The Game of Numbers. And he says, an average salesperson uh, focuses on what to say, while a successful person focuses on how to say it. And then the second part was an average salesperson focuses on what people are thinking while a successful salesperson focuses on what people are feeling. So once I knew the product, then I knew the presentation, then I was able to focus on the actual delivery of it and really connect with the person. Um, so those, those were, those were things that helped me through my process. Phenomenal, man. I love it. Uh, it, it, it blows my mind. Cause you know, Patrick has had his read in that book. It's the book of the month game of numbers by Nick Murray. And uh, he really breaks down that book in four sections in terms of the game of numbers, which is, which is, um, you know, just the, 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 your, your behavior, your, 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 your belief, your endurance. And the last one is skills, which was, was kind of like, wait, people think that skills is number one. Right. And so uh, what, what's some of the biggest mistakes that you faced as a young entrepreneur uh, in sales that, that if somebody watching this right now is listening, if you avoid this, you get much more ahead uh, or early in your career as a, in, in sales or as an entrepreneur. I think, I think the first thing I had to overcome was consistency um, in terms of being consistent every day in my effort. And there was a, a quote that I heard and it really helped me change the way I valued it in my day at the end of the day. Because as an entrepreneur, at the end of the day, we all have that check-in with ourselves while we're driving home, we're leaving the office, you know, we're reflecting. Um, and I think that the, the quote said, don't judge the day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds you plant. And I started to realize that the days that I felt the most confident uh, about my business and where I was going were, were the days that I worked the hardest. And regardless of what results came, I started to find faith in, uh, in work ethic. Um, and so I was very inconsistent. And that's, that's what created inconsistent income. They say inconsistent thinking uh, or erratic performance stems from erratic thinking. Inconsistent performance stems from inconsistent thinking. Um, I was really up and down. I'd get excited and build some momentum. Then something would happen. I'd get discouraged. And I would let those little failures kind of throw me off and then lose my momentum. And so I think um, developing emotional maturity uh, was another one. So consistency was one, emotional maturity, how to change uh, the way I saw things, how to have more faith in the process okay. um, was another one. And um, how, how, did you, how did you realize that you weren't emotionally mature? Like what would go on? What would go wrong? So when... I realized it in my inconsistency, my performance and the power of a mentor, because we were in an environment, right? And this is the power of finding a coach, finding a mentor, uh, holding yourself accountable. At that moment, I had a lot of external accountability. And so when you have external accountability and you have to put the numbers up for what you did, um, you, you could see the inconsistency. And then when you get called out on it, <laughs> okay. right? I, I, again, I was, I wish I would have said I had the awareness and the foresight to really inspect my business, but I, I didn't at that moment. I was still coming from that employee mindset, trying to become an entrepreneur. And so instead of having a boss, I found a coach. And um, for the people that watch your, your channel and your content, YouTube wasn't really big at that point. This was uh, 2005, 2006, 2007. It hadn't really blown up. And there weren't people like you creating content and coaching and challenging and teaching and people that maybe I could reach out to for mentorship or work with or intern with. And um, if I would have, that's all I was looking for. But, but I also knew what I needed. I needed a coach. I needed a mentor. Um, so external accountability pointed out a lot of those, those weaknesses. And, um, and then through processing with, with Patrick, who Matt talked about as a CEO of PHP agency, my, our, our mentor, my mentor at the time, um, he was able to help me to, to see that. And, and so it was something that I, I, I learned from a mentor, from a coach. Um, 
Got the, the emotional inconsistency. One, one of the things you, you, what excited you early on in your career, being mentored by Patrick, and um, you know, I hear stories about it now, but one of, one of the first questions you ask Patrick, you're like, dude, where's a Ferrari? Where's a Ferrari, right? What, what did you mean by that at that point in your life? Is a young entrepreneur, where's a Ferrari? Why'd you ask that question? So, so we did a meeting. You got to remember, like the, me- the movies that were around back then were like Boiler Room, right? Okay. Uh, like that, that's, that's, that's what it was. And so we, I leave the meeting and I don't know who Patrick is. He's just selling the dream, speaking, talking about challenging people. He's intense. And I was like, I was like, oh, hey, man, where, where, where's your Ferrari? I was just, I, I, I attributed success to like, you know, cars and, and stuff like that. Cause that's, that's what you learn. And so, and he just waved, he didn't say anything. And then like two weeks later, a week or two weeks later, Matt, I, I'm in the room and he says, you know, somebody asked me, where's my Ferrari? And you guys probably laugh at me because I drive a Ford Focus. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'm the Ferrari guy. I was just I didn't mean it. I didn't know what he was driving at the time. And he says, but let me show you my savings. And he pulls up his mutual funds. He was 26, when I, I think, at that time. And he had like 50 grand, 100 grand, another 30 grand here, 40 grand here, 50 grand. And I'm like, he says. I don't just sell the dream. I live the dream. And, uh, and I was like, wow, you know, that was, that was a, a switch for me to look at what really mattered with money, you know, and a lot of guys want to kind of sell the dream and they sell it, I think too soon. And they hurt themselves versus saying, Hey, let me go stack a hundred thousand. Let me go put two, 300,000, 500,000 cash. Like, let me go so I can breathe. And, um, and that's why, um, you know, I, I, I learned that from him on saving money and, and doing those things in the beginning versus going out and spending. And eventually we got the Z06 and eventually we got the 488 Ferrari. And um, those were fun. Those were fun things. Um, but but uh, none of them compared to to that, to that, to the to, to, to recreating yourself and, and being res- finding respect for who you are in your process, in your journey. George, you're half Puerto Rican. You're half Cuban. Right. What are some of the mindset roadblocks as you bring insurance, as you bring entrepreneurship to the Latino community? Let's let's remove Goya products away from the conversation for a second. <laughs> but what, what what are some of the objections or setbacks that you are that you experience or continue to experience when you're helping people in finance and educating them about money, educating them about insurance, educating them about capitalism and free enterprise and entrepreneurship? Because there's one thing we know, bro. It's Latinos are very hard workers. And, and sometimes they validate themselves like, you know what? If this is commission or if this is business and I don't get paid right away, why do it? Or why should I do it? I'll, I'll just stop right there because I got other four or five add-ons to that. But what, what, would, you say, what would you say to that? I think there's from, from the client aspect of what we do in terms of sitting down with somebody, that, that moment that you meet with a client, they're looking at you and saying, what do you want from me? You know, what do you want to sell me? And they literally have a wall built, even though they've never met you, they don't know anything about you. They already have a perception of that. And so, um, and the more I worried about what they were thinking, the more I got thrown off my own game. And eventually the, that transition that happened, right? Because that was, that was a struggle. Um, you just realize that you can't control the outcome. Mm-hmm. And then you play loose and you're like, dude, I don't care if you're going to do something or not, because I believe in what I'm doing. So that not looking for validation in the moment from mm-hmm. a client or not looking for acceptance, they don't know what it is to be financially independent. Otherwise, they'd already have a million, two million dollars put away. So I think for me, I had to uh, to become aware of that because clients don't expect a client to be open to what you're saying. You have to make them open. They don't have a reason to be open. You have to build a relationship. Maybe they've had a bad experience. Maybe nobody ever educated them. Maybe they have an, a poor identity because they didn't grow up in that environment. Um, and you're literally coming and meeting somebody and then trying to help them create some new habits in their life. And I think those are uh, uh, the challenging things, right, in, in our business of insurance and financial services is you're having to help people create a new habit. And then when you show them about savings or insurance, the first thing they do is they look at investments as a bill. And, and, and the question comes up like, well, how, how much do I have to put into that? And, and when somebody asks, how much do I have to pay or how much do I have to save, right? When it's their own savings, it tells you that they have an edu- they, they look at literally an investment, what I'm going to contribute every month to my investments or my insurance or whatever as a bill. 
And uh, that's why they don't have a lot of savings in the first place. And so we have to show them what they could have in the long term. And finally, that gives them enough perspective to get out of that moment and say, okay, well, I could have two, 300,000 saved. I could have a half a million put away. I could have this. Um, but it's, it's dealing with the skepticism, communicating from a place where you could build trust and likability, likability right off the bat, then trust, being authentic, and then showing value. Uh, but that, that, that would be the hardest part with, with clients is kind of breaking that, that sure. barrier, you know, that people have up. What, what about from an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial standpoint, what are some of the barriers that you find yourself having to break down and build up? The employee mentality, uh, the employee mentality, it's such a, it's such um, I, I'm sensitive to the way that people are to not offend people, but it's, it's, people got to open their eyes and just look at the reality that if that way of thinking worked, people would be financially independent and it just doesn't, it does not work in producing financially independent people fast enough. Um, the fact that, and, and I just look at data, you know, the fact that majority of people are going to retire after 40 years living on 40% of what they were making, that's not success. Um, that's not financial success. And then all successes are money related. They could be great people, raise great kids, but financially, why, why we live in the richest country in the world. How do you fail financially with, with the internet, with resources, you know, you, you, you chose to go that route and it, it just doesn't work. And I think, where does that stem from? Right. Who they're around, who raises them? I guarantee you kid Warren Buffett's kids aren't like, where do I go get a job? Or Bill Gates kids aren't thinking, where do I go get a job? A job is a mentality that's learned from somebody that has a job. And you rarely see entrepreneurs tell their kids they have to go be employees, but you'll see employees tell their kids they got to go become employees. And it's not a shot. No, no offense to anybody watching this. Your parents do the best that they can. But when you look at who has a better life, that person that's your parent or the person that owns the company, who has more control of their schedule, who makes more money? We just lose sight of that. And people are institutionalized through school for 12 years and then another college for four more years. So it's 16 years of being institutionalized to be an employee. Of course, they're going to have a hard time looking at entrepreneurship. And they look at this is risky. Risky for me is give up the rest of your life, never make a lot of money, never live your life, never drink. That's risky. So breaking that employee mentality um, and breaking a lack of. So, so one, the employee mentality and two is their, 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 their work ethic habits and not wanting to hustle and like wanting to to. Um, to just underperform. This girl told me anything I do, I do hundred percent. I said, no, you don't. I said, I don't believe you. I said, <laughs> you know, where did you learn that? I said, it's better to do something for five hours a week, 10 hours a week, building your own business and not do it at all. What, what are you doing with that time? And getting people to see you got 168 hours in a week. How many of them are, are being invested? How many of them are being wasted? So breaking the job mentality, breaking the that, that limited mentality of I want a nine to five check in, check out, kind of not do anything when I'm not working at my job. Um, breaking that I'm busy mentality. I'm busy. We have 168 hours in a week. You work 40, you sleep 40, you do, you hang out with family for 40, you still got 40 hours left. So getting people to, to break their mold. Um, and you can't, I, 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 I do it, we do it more through a way of teaching people, obviously. Um, but it's just, it's just a, it's a very, Small thinking. It's like, let me tell you, I'll pay you 20 bucks an hour, 25. I'll pay you 42 bucks an hour. <gasps> right. And you tell somebody I'll pay you 500 bucks an hour. They're like, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. You know, people, their belief system, they've learned how to accept less instead of expect more. You know, George, you know, one of the things you're very proud of is taking what you've learned and imparting it upon others. And I think one of the things that you're very proud of in that Forbes article was your team. Let's show that here in a second. But you're very proud of this picture right here. Right. You're, 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 you're very proud of this picture. Look, look, look at the smile on your face. Yeah. Everybody, yeah, look at the smile on George's face right now. Why are you, why are you proud of this picture? Because I've seen, um, I've seen, you know, when you tell somebody, Hey, come into our business, this is going to change your life. And then you see it actually changing their life. Um, the, the gentleman to the left, his name is Elvis Okafor. I met Elvis. You, he was 22 years old, Matt, when I met him. He's 24, 24, 25 now. And uh, this month, he's at $30,000 for the month. He's going to make $40,000 this month. Uh, he's got a, he's, how many 24-year-olds 
make 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 forty thousand dollars a month, have over a hundred thousand dollars in savings, cash liquid. Um, the guys next to him, Fred and Chrissy Terrace, they'll make forty fifty thousand dollars this month. Uh, former bartender and server. She actually has a degree from UCLA in journalism, and then ended up working in the restaurant know. business. Wow. Uh-huh. And he's got he's got a degree as well in uh, 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 forgot the, the 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 subject, but they all three of those guys have degrees. They're all edu- college educated. Elvis has a degree in engineering, um, and so just their stories transform. And Cindy used to do uh, she was a medical student, and uh, uh, Cindy this month I think she's already at fifty thousand uh, dollars <laughs> for the month. Um, and then Ernie and Sharon Sears. Corporate America, Rebox, Post Office, 30 years, own their own business. They were making 100 grand a month, Matt, uh, owning a school, a little preschool. And when the economy crashed in 2008, everybody had to save money and they realized that they weren't in a recession proof business. And so just seeing those guys start from scratch, start from nothing uh, to a thousand a month, three thousand a month, five thousand a month, take a step back, go through life. Uh, you're in the trenches with them. You know, you're a Marine. And so. You know, those 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 uh, battle buddies and those I didn't I didn't do military. So for me, these are, you know, my battle buddies. Um, yep. Yep. People. Yeah. Isn't uh, 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 Sears their son? What, what's up with their son? A lot of things happen with him with the Olympics and high jumping. Isn't he at USC? Yeah, he's at USC. Um, it's, it's crazy. They did a vision board when they first got started and their son was I think he was eight um, at that time. And so he saw mom and dad do a vision board. He goes to his room. He does a vision board. He's eight years old at the time. And he put Olympics on there. Okay. And he ends up, Ernie coaches him. Ernie and Sharon both played sports. Sports. They're both athletes. Athletes. They coach, coach, coach. He ends up getting a scholarship to USC, um, not just in basketball, but in track. And he's right now, I think, number five or six in the world. Um, so he was going pre-Olympics and so now with the whole setback, they're figuring it out, but literally from an eight year old doing a vision board, putting Olympics on there to now being pre-qualified for the Olympics, it just tells you the power of vision and, um, they got, they're great parents, man, great family people. So. That's awesome, man. You know, one of the things we say in entrepreneurship is it's cool if it's for you, but your proof of concept is imparting that upon other people. So George, tell us about, tell us about your organization. You got unity behind you in a bookcase, custom-made bookcase, and your team gave you a special painting or special uh, uh, special thing for uh, board council. You, you care to share that? Uh, yeah, share? I was I was showing I was uh, showing Matt before we had uh, one of my guys. It's funny how we met him. We're making calls, Matt, and I'm looking for a new some new agents. So I'm saying, hey, man, I got your number. It was a number that was a referral from a client, and – they had changed their number. So I'm looking for a woman. He picks up, obviously not a woman. And I said, Hey, well, you know, since I got you on the phone anyways, right. They say you, 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 you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Right. So I'm like, Hey, do I got you on the phone? Do you keep your options open? He says to what? And I said, well, to business, to becoming an entrepreneur, doing something part-time, you know, keep your job, make some extra money. He says, yeah, I'm open. He gets started, um, becomes an agent, becomes a broker. He made $25,000 last month and he was a wrong number. So I was, wow. so he's, he stopped by the, the office today and uh, 25 grand last month, he made 25 grand last month and he was a wrong number. Like, you, you, yeah, but this is something he brought us. I think you guys can see it there. So. One life. Yep. Leave it. One person. Make it count. I love it. What does that mean to you? You know, when I first saw it, I didn't know if it was what the number meant 400 and I, and then I, I was able to kind of take a step back and, and to think that, you know, like God gives us a ticket, God gives us a ticket to like, here's, here is one chance at life. And, and I remember, I think it was um, Steve Jobs that said, all fear goes away when you're approaching death. And it really puts into perspective the things that really matter, don't matter, the things you're going to like, we are so held up in life by by fear, by worry, by obligations, by past failures. Um, and, and for me, it just means, you know, you got one life at this thing. Like who, who cares what people are going to think about you? Who cares if you've made a mistake? I think we hold on to it more than people are. People aren't even thinking about your mistake. They're thinking about their own mistake. And, and for me, it's just, it's remembering this thing's going to be over, you know, 
it's going to be over like this. Um, max it out. So that's what that means to me. What is what is Unity mean to you? Why did you name your Why did you name your business Unity? Uh, I didn't have a big family growing up. It's just my mom, my dad, my sister, and my brother, and my grandma. So uh, I would see, you know, all these Filipino families with 72. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just playing that. I would see all these families with like. It was y'all Latinos, man. We, we, oh, we, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So we're Cuban, we're Puerto Rican. My, my, uh, my dad's an only child. Mom's sisters are kind of, they do their thing. Um, so it was a very small family. And I would see these, these paintings like over the fireplace, like the wife and the husband and the kids and the kid's wife and they're in the dogs and their kids. Like, I was like, man, I just want to one day have like a big family. And so we, we, we pick names on what do we want to name our company? What do we want to name our organization? And, uh, we chose unity because in life, when you can form a relationship with somebody and you can form a bond, that's just unbreakable. There's nothing that can't be accomplished with when people are that way. And so that's what I wanted around me. Uh, loyalty is a big thing for me. Um, I think it's a big thing for everybody and we attract what we are. Um, so finding, building a family, building an environment where this isn't just a business. Um, you know, I, I wanted this to be a family. I didn't want to just be somewhere I come to work every day, but I want it to be somewhere I come and I'm excited to see the people I'm working with. And I know we've created those environments in our offices. So that's what it meant. So George, when, you, when you're coaching young entrepreneurs, what, what jacks you up about saying, man, I, I want to spend some time with this young entrepreneur. They got these certain qualities or they bring a certain skill set or they bring a certain mindset. What, what would that all be? What would, what would jack you up? You know, you're, you're in Forbes, featured Yahoo Finance. Uh, you're about to make a million bucks here. Uh, you're in the top 1% of income in America. If somebody wants to get coached by George, if somebody wants to be helped by George and they want to be the next, you know, Elvis Okafor, they want to be the next Cindy Cobas, they want to be the next, you know, uh, our, our Ernie and Sharon Sears and Freddie and Chrissy Terrace. They want to say, I want to be, I want to be part of that picture. You know, what's some of what's some of the qualities that George would look for and say, you know what, I'm gonna lock onto you? Um, I think hunger factor is number one. It like hunger factor when you're sitting there, you're like, well, I went we went to dinner and we were in front of uh some friends and we're having some conversations, and I got a couple of new guys uh that are in front of me and they ask zero questions at dinner. And then we got one of the guys at dinner that's asking who's making a lot more money. He's asking 10, 15, 20 questions. And I thought at that moment, I said, wow, this person's comfortable, right? Either one, they're comfortable, they're full, they, they're, they're comfortable where they are. Or two, uh, they have an ego issue, right? While you're not asking questions to learn from somebody that's been in your business that you're doing. Um, or three, they're just not thinking about those things. And they're just looking at this situation as more of a casual situation versus a growth opportunity. And and I, I, I get it. But Anytime I was around Patrick or around successful people, anybody, anytime I was, I was quiet. I wasn't trying to talk because if, if, if you're making $2 million a year, right. I, I want, I want to know what you're doing to make $220,000 a month. That's what I want to know. So I'm going to be asking questions. I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be taking notes. I want to know your thought process. So when people ask me like processing questions, when people ask questions, when people are hungry to take notes, um, that, somebody's hungry to learn the teacher's hungry to teach. And so I think, I think uh, a student mentality um, is one, I think two. So hungry, number two is humble. Uh, I think humility is a very attractive quality in people. And when I get around people, um, I, I want to learn. I do. We, we were, we actually were at the event we were together at recently. Uh, we took Mackie's out to dinner. Uh, it's a couple that Matt and Sheena mentor uh, and these guys have been in the business. They did a million dollars in sales their first year as brokers. Um, that's the power of your mentorship, man, uh, to what you guys are doing. And my, my hat is off to you guys. You guys are building some, some phenomenal people. And so I'm looking at this group of, uh, I think there was maybe 20 qualifiers there and we had a chance to choose dinner. I'm like, dude, I want to go get around Mackie's cause I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn about you. I wanted to learn about how Sheena coaches. So the best way, instead of asking Sheena, <laughs> and, and Matt, what they do, let me go take your guys out. And, and I'm sitting there, I'm a boards council. We're, we're at 840 in income right now. And I'm just like, okay, tell me this, 
tell me this. And I'm, I'm asking the questions. I think I asked questions for 20 minutes straight. Um, and so hum, humility, like you're, you can you have so much to learn from somebody, regardless of what you think, you know, and Socrates said, uh, all I know is I know nothing at all. And so, so hunger factor to learn humility, um, in that. And then the last part for me is somebody that's just a fun person to be around and has great energy. Um, I love, I, I'm a, I'm a person, I feel what you feel. So when somebody has a positive spirit, like a good attitude, uh, that's just the most attractive thing to me, man. Attitude is, is the most sexy thing in the world for people. Um, because it's, it's just, it's life. You're grateful. It's an attitude. Oh, man, I'm happy. I'm grateful. Like you feed, we all feed off that. So those are the three things that I look for in people that I'm going to mentor and they suck mentorship out of me as well. So. George, uh, uh, obviously you're based there in uh, Tarzana, but uh, as people are watching this, you know, I'm, I'm a young entrepreneur or I want to be a young entrepreneur. How can people find you? How can people get in contact with you? How can people reach out to you? What's the easiest way to get in contact with George Palat? Uh, Instagram would be the best way. Uh, Instagram, send me a message. It's I A M I am George. That's Spanish J O R G E. Jorge. And last, yeah, Jorge. And last name Palayo. P E L A Y O. I am George Palayo. Um, is the easiest way to get a hold of us. And uh, I will get back to you. We get a lot of messages, but I definitely will get back to you. Um, it's the easiest way or Facebook, but, but Instagram more so than anything. Awesome, man. Listen, bro, I, I, I'm looking forward to continuing to march with you as my fellow business partner here in, uh, in the best years of our firm together. You know, you, you bring a huge, a tremendous amount of a body of work, a body of experience, you know, and just to think, bro, you started this way, what, 18? You said 18? Yeah, I was 18, 18, 19. And, and now you're entering, technically you're entering your mid thirties. <laughs> 30, 34 in, in eight days, man. 34. Eight days. So happy early birthday to you, man. Thanks, we brother. Today in advance. But, uh, well, you know, since you're on your birthday, let me ask you right now, what's one thing that you learned from the last year? What's one big lesson you learned from this last year, whether it be through the last six months of the pandemic, last you know, 11 months and, and three weeks, what's the big lesson that you're learning from this, that you're taking into the next year? I, I would say to be grateful, um, the power of the power of gratitude. There was, um, there's a great song and uh, I'm trying to remember uh, who it's by. It's a Christian song. And it says, um, things aren't falling apart. They're falling into place. And, um, I think, I think, uh, you know, you get to, everybody's got a different age, but for me at 33, I started looking and saying, wow, you're close to 40, but I like, you know, are you, are you, if that's halfway through your life, right? How much have you actually accomplished? And I had to have some perspective to that of, of saying, wow, I got to really, if I want to do these things, I have to grow more. And, um, and so really just really being really looking at life for what it is right now and, and being grateful. Um, I, I try to control my thoughts. I try to control my attitude more than ever. Uh, I try to be uh, good to everybody around me, bring value to that. So um, I'm going into a season of, of personal growth, um, Bill. growth and gratitude. And, you know, I appreciate being on, on your channel, Matt. I know you are interviewing all kinds of, of people these days and um it's, it's great exposure from a marketing aspect, but, but that gratitude piece, that's real. Like I, I looked at it the other day, I was sitting here and I'm, I have a window that, that looks out and I was thinking about who are you in business with? Who are the people that are in your life right now? And one of the hardest things to find is people that are committed to greatness, committed to, to that. And you and Sheena are an example of that. Um, Jose and Marlene are an example of that. And uh, just grateful for the partners, grateful for Patrick, grateful for this industry that changed my life. Took a regular kid um, that was 18 years old, that was insecure and, and afraid, and uh, just kind of helped him uh, become a man and become an entrepreneur. Um, have a lot of gratitude. And I feel a level of responsibility to give that back to people more than I ever have, because I know I wouldn't be where I'm at without that kind of coach and leadership 
of Patrick but David and um, and my partners. And so uh, the next the next few years, the next four or five years, um, as we go into 20 years in business, is really um, just become the best version of myself and become a great asset to the people that are around me and make sure I do my part to help them and their organizations as well. Because we appreciate everything you and Sheena do uh, for the company. And we're really excited for, for, uh, for your new promotion um, with CDO. And uh, everybody in that room was just jacked up when Patrick made that announcement, like sincerely. And, uh, and I thought, man, what an awesome, what an awesome thing for Matt with your story um, to, 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 you know, to build something and then that to be taken and then to come back and dominate and, um, and then be in a position, put yourself in a position to lead the company. What a, what a, but it's awesome, man. I was just, I was super excited for you and Sheena and, uh, and I'm super excited for the partnership and where it's going to go in life. When I know we're busy, we're always working and running, but you, you're nothing but value, man. So thank you. Folks, you've been listening to George Palau here, leading team unity here, co-owner and the youngest board council of PHP agency. Make sure you find him, connect with him on Instagram at George Palayo, Jorge Palayo. Uh, we'll make sure we have the links down here below too as well. So you've been watching this show. Listen, you heard from George from from, from 18 years old, uh, 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 Red Lobster to 840 income, about to be the next millionaire, cash flow millionaire. And if you watch his stories, if you watch his social media presence, uh, you know, he's got a lot of cool things going on, real estate, investing, cars. He had a Z06, he had a Ferrari, all these different things. But look at him, humble, hungry, student of business, grateful. Uh, I'm excited uh, to work together with you, George, and more, more specifically uh, with the body of work that you created with Team Unity and to see the new people that you got rising up with inside your organization and, uh, and the best years of PHP Agency, man. Just think about it, bro. The best years of PHP Agency are going to be under your watch, under your guidance, under, under this next evolution, this next era uh, where we got going, man. And uh, I'm excited about the people that you're about to coach and mentor the new senior vice presidents we got coming up, the next cash flow millions you got coming up. I mean, you've you've helped out uh, uh, Cindy Cobos and uh, obviously Rodolfo and Ceci Vargas, our good friends out there. If there's a BFF that my wife has, <laughs> it's with uh, Ceci Vargas, part of your organization there in Houston, Texas, man. And uh, same thing on how I feel the same way too about Rodolfo. But I appreciate you for what you do, man. And uh, in terms of my position here as CEO of, of, of the company, my biggest thank you to you um, is to have massive success. Uh, best way for me to respond is just not by talking about it, but by being about it. And uh, again, great to be with you, bro. Um, looking forward to this. And uh, again, if you've been watching this show, make sure you share this. Share this with the young entrepreneur. Share those. Matter of fact, sh share it with the server. Share it with somebody that's working uh, at Denny's. Share it with somebody that's working at Red Lobster. Share it with somebody that's working at Olive Garden like I was. Bro, do you still remember the birthday song at Red Lobster? Happy, happy birthday from all of us to you. We wish it was our birthday so we could party too. Yeah, bro. <laughs> of course I do. That was bone a fiesta. What a joyous day. We're so glad. <laughs> oh, that's yes, yes, yes. You're right. Damn, man. Do it again, Matt. No, just joking. <laughs> Things you just don't forget, man. And I'm so glad that I'm glad that I spent time as a server because it got me a, a chance to unwind coming from the military and have and just get used to non-military people, uh, you know, post-military and, and use that as a bridge to entrepreneurship. But that's another story. Folks, if you're watching this, make sure you click like, drop your comments below. I know you guys have been chatting away and share this with an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur, share this with a server who's considering entrepreneurship. So make sure you stay tuned. Make sure you like our Facebook page. Make sure you click like to our YouTube channel. Drop your thoughts, comments below. Let them know what you think and so we can create content to help you think like a millionaire strategize like a millionaire and obviously to become a first generation cash flow millionaire. George, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, brother. Gotcha. I'm having George Ply. I'm a money smart guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart and be money smart today. Bless you guys. George, talk to you soon, brother.